Good evening. Welcome to our Good Friday service. It is the day when scriptures will tell us that Jesus was crucified to the cross and died. It is a somewhat sober, sombering service this evening. And uh, we welcome you. We welcome you that are here in person. We also welcome you that are are with, worshiping with us on Facebook this evening. We're glad that you are here. It is our hope that uh, this service will be <clears throat> somewhat uplifting, give you something to think about between now and Sunday morning when we celebrate the resurrected Christ. So thank you for being here. On this day, we gather to remember our Savior, who loved us and gave himself for us. Let us draw near in full assurance of God's endless love and mercy. And if you would join me in the, in the responsive reading. We give our thanks and praise to Jesus Christ, who carries our sorrows, heals our wounds, and redeems us from sin and death. And let's sing... Hymn number 504. Those of you who are here, if, you, if you're able, please stand.
God's word, John 19, 16 through 22. <coughs> then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus away. Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called the place of the skull. In Hebrew, Golgotha. There they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them, and Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, so that many people could read it. Then the leader, then the leading priest objected and said to Pilate, Change it from King of the Jews to, he said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate replied, No, what I have written, I have written. What wondrous love is this, O my soul, O my soul? What wondrous love is this, O my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse for my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. What wondrous love is this, O oh, my soul, O oh, my soul? What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of life to lay aside his crown for my soul, for my soul? To lay aside his crown for my soul. John nineteen twenty three through twenty seven. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to this disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. You may remain seated for the singing of the rest of the hymns. Beneath the cross, number 297, three verses.
My readings from John chapter 19, verses 28 through 37. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It was the day of preparation, and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there the next day, <clears throat> which was the Sabbath, and a very special Sabbath because it was Passover week. So they asked Pilate to hasten their deaths by ordering that their legs be broken. Then their bodies could be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. So they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you also may continue to believe. These things happen in fulfillment of the scriptures that say, not one of his bones will be broken, and they will look on the one they pierced. When I survey the wondrous cross, and again, you can remain seated. God's Word, John 19, 38 to 42. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. When Pilate gave permission, Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to, at Jesus at night. He brought about 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Following Jesus' burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body with the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. The place of crucifixion was near a garden where, they had, where there was a new tomb, never used before. And so because it was the day of preparation for the Jewish Passover, and since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. And let's just do three verses instead of four. 
Jesus, keep me near the cross. If you want to stand, you can. If you want to sit, that's fine. I don't know about you, but I find it all so incredible. Do you? To think about where Jesus has been in the last six days. Yes, it's just six days ago that Jesus entered into Jerusalem with his disciples. How in the world did we ever get from a day of celebration and joy, the waving of palm branches, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, cloaks on the ground so that they could walk upon them. How did we get from there to six days later, Jesus hanging on a cross, nearing a point of death, to go from such celebration and praise to such anger and hatred, bitterness, hostility. But the other thing I find so incredible is the fact that even while Jesus was on the cross, in his dying moments, he was focused on other people more concerned with others than he was about himself. Think about it for a minute. If, if we were to look back in, in Luke 23, 32 to 37, John tells us that there were two, two criminals hanging on, that were crucified with him, one on either side of him. He doesn't go into any detail, so looking back at Luke, just for a, a other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. And when they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. 
Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Really? Jesus, suspended on that cross, watching the soldiers gambling for his clothes, rolling dice for them, others mocking him, ridiculing him, spitting upon him, belittling belittling him in every imaginable way. And yet Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. (laughs) Wow. It, It just doesn't seem to make sense. That's not what you and I would be doing, is it? But then you and I aren't Jesus. Jesus, holy divine and holy human, totally human. That story in Luke goes on. It says one of the criminals who was hanging, who who was hung there, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, and we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, he hasn't done anything wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. (laughs) Pretty amazing words. We don't know anything about the the two criminals, do we? We don't know their names. We don't know what crimes they were, they were accused of or found guilty of. We don't have any idea. All we know is that the one continued to mock Jesus, to belittle him, and the other turned to Jesus. I guess in some respects you'd almost call it a, a, death, a deathbed confession. Remember me when you enter your kingdom. Some might ask me if I believe in deathbed confessions. Yes, I do, absolutely. I received one the very first week of serving a church in northeast Indiana. Just a matter of two days or three days after I had experienced my first Sunday in a pulpit as a pastor. One of my parishioners came up to me, and if if I've told this story before, forgive me, but I think it's important. One of my parishioners came up to me. Her name was Kim, and Kim said, Pastor, I don't know how far you are from a particular hospital in Fort Wayne, but could you possibly go and see my grandfather? She said, He's dying, he's unconscious, he's not aware of anything going on around him, he hasn't spoken, said anything, he hasn't, he doesn't stare in the room, he's just non-responsive, he's been that way for days. I don't know where he stands in his faith with God. Could you go and talk to my grandfather? I said, sure. So, I went to the hospital and I was in ICU when one of the nurses, it was just him and me, and one of the nurses went by the door and she backtracked and she came back to the door and she's, I'm not sure who you are, but she said, he's not aware of anything. He can't hear you, he can't talk with you, he's not been responding to anything or anybody for days now. He just lays there. 
And I said, well, if it's all the same to you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here for a few minutes and, and just talk to him. She kind of rolled her eyes and she said, well, suit yourself. And away she went. I stood at the man's bedside and I called him by name. I told him who I was, that I was the pastor at Kim's church. Kim was very concerned about him because she didn't know where he stood in his faith. And, she said, and I said, I'd like to have a word of prayer with you. And I'm standing holding his hand at the same time, which is pretty typical, common for me. But as I'm, as I'm talking with him, I said, I'd like to be able to pray for you. And I offered a prayer. And when I got all done, I said, you know, I, I'd really like to pray a prayer that you could follow along with me and be able to have you repeat after me. And I just don't need to say anything out loud, but just repeat after me. You can, you can just keep it between yourself and God. And so I prayed a, a prayer asking for forgiveness, declaring his knowledge and the fact that he was asking Jesus into his heart and into his life. And I took it just a few steps at a time. And when I got all done, I called him by name and I said, if, if you have prayed this prayer, squeeze my hand. Wow. Was that a twitch or what was that, God? <laughs> and so I went ahead and prayed a little bit more for this man that God would truly accept him into his kingdom. And I had this man again repeat several things after me. And once again I said, if you've prayed this prayer with me, squeeze my hand again. You know, it's just that I need some proof. <laughs> That's the way I look at this man on the cross. We don't know anything about him. Did he know Jesus? Had he ever encountered him at all? Had he heard anything that Jesus had taught? And yet, in his dying moments, he said, Jesus, remember me, and it's acknowledgement of who Jesus was. Remember me. You know, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart and profess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. I think it qualified. Jesus said today, not next week, next month, 10 years down the road, today you will be with me in paradise. Then there's a third story. And that story was in our gospel today. It talks about Jesus looking down from the cross and being aware that his mother and Mary and, uh, Mary, and Mary Magdalene and Mary's sister were all there. And when he looked down at his mother and he looked over, he saw the disciple that he loved. It's assumed to be John. And he told his mother, Woman, behold your son. Woman is a term of endearment. Woman, behold your son. And with that, he's surrendering his mother over to the care of John. And to the disciple, he said, Behold your mother. What, did I say that right? Behold your son and behold your mother. Jesus did on that cross in his dying moments that were very crucial. One, he forgave 
those who were persecuting him, who were the ones who hauled him off to the Golgotha and nailed him to the cross, who drove the spikes in his hands and in his feet, Two, he accepted the plea, the confession of the criminal next to him. And the third, he made arrangements for his mother. <laughs> kind of goes right along with the fifth commandment, doesn't it? Love your mother and your father. You know, little did Mary know when angel Gabriel came to her that night and told her she would give birth to the Son of God. 33 years earlier, um, Mark Lowry put out a song which you've heard before. Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Did you know that your baby boy has come to make you new? This child that you delivered will soon deliver you. Mary, did you know that your baby boy will give sight to a blind man? Mary, did you know that your baby boy will calm the storm with his hand? Did you know that your baby boy has walked where angels trod? When you kiss your little baby, you kiss the face of God. Mary, did you know the blind will see, the deaf will hear, the dead will live again, the, la the lame will leap, the dumb will speak the, the praises of the Lamb. Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know? Did you know, Mary, that your baby boy is heaven's perfect Lamb? The sleeping child you're holding is the great I am? <laughs> no, Mary didn't know. Nor did she understand any more than we're able to understand when things don't go our way, when they don't go quite like we had anticipated, when death takes a loved one from us. The one thing Mary did know was the love of Jesus Christ. The love Jesus had for her as he entrusted her care to John. She knew beyond any doubt that her future was secure. But little did she know that she had, he had not only taken care of her earthly care, but also of her eternal care. Now, some people may ask, well, why didn't Jesus entrust her care to his brothers? Scriptures are clear. Jesus' brothers did not yet believe in him as the Messiah, as the Savior. Jesus entrusted her to the care of one that he absolutely knew with no shadow of a doubt he could trust. And in so doing, he was faithful to that fifth commandment, as I mentioned a minute ago, honor your mother and your father. So what are some things we can learn from his dying words? I think one of the things is all through his ministry, Jesus always focused on the needs of other people, didn't he? And so should we. The Life Application Bible says our families are the precious gifts from God and we should value and care for them under all circumstances. Neither Christian work nor key responsibilities in any job 
or position excuse us from caring for our families. In Jesus' dying words, that's exactly what he did. But the text also went on a little bit this morning when Jesus said it is finished. So let's take a look at that for just a moment. It is finished. Teleo, T-E-L-E-O. It's derived from the Greek word telos, and it means to end, to complete, to, con to bring to a conclusion of an act, to accomplish, to, to pay, to discharge a debt. Teleos, it is finished. So what did Jesus mean? Well, I think there are several things. First, prophecy has been fulfilled. If we looked in Isaiah 53, 3, 4, and 5, we would read these words. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we consider him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed by, for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And his wounds, and by his wounds, we are all healed. You know, from Jesus' birth in Bethany, in Bethlehem, to his death on the cross, all Old Testament prophecy had become a reality with his crucifixion. Everything foretold by the prophets had come true. Every foretelling of the coming Messiah's life and death for our sin has been finished, has been fulfilled. It is finished. Secondly, Jesus' suffering was finished, Isaiah 53, 10. And yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though, the, and though the, the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will, see, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And they and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Jesus suffered horribly. He knew the pain of rejection. He had seen the crowds turn against him from the beginning of his ministry, if we went back to Luke 4, there's a story about Jesus opening the scroll in a, in a temple, in a service, in a synagogue service. And he read what was on the words, and at the end of the reading, the people there wanted to take him out and throw him off the edge of a cliff. Get him out of town. To the Pharisees, who were, thought they were the righteous ones, to the scribes, the teachers of the law. Yes, even his followers, the disciples. The very ones who had walked with him, taught with him, witnessed the miracles, all turned against him in this horrible week. And now the physical, psychological, emotional pain all come together on the cross. Yes, Jesus' words, it is finished. Prophecy was finished. And Jesus was suffering. Jesus' suffering was now finished. But the final thing, and one of the most important points, God's plan of salvation was now complete. Think about it for a minute. Everything needed for the atonement of sin had been accomplished. Yes, the resurrection was yet to come, but the price had been paid. His resurrection was God's work, but Jesus paid the price. The act of offering sacrifices, the belief that one earned salvation by living a perfect life, a sin-free life, 
the need for one to earn their way into heaven, which no one could ever achieve. I think it's in Ephesians that it says we are saved by grace. We're saved by faith through grace. You know, it all ended with Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, played, paid the price for you and for me. I quoted that Romans text before, Romans 10, 9, and 10. If you believe in your heart and profess with your lips that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. When Jesus said it's finished, prophecy was fulfilled. Jesus' suffering was over. Mankind's need for, to atone for our sins came to an end. It's saying we have a Savior. We have a Savior. It is finished. Four things Jesus did on that cross, and maybe there were more. He forgave those that were at the foot of the cross who had persecuted him, who were punishing him brutally, who had hung him on the cross. Father, forgive them. He, fa he, he, he forgave the one on the, the uh, criminal next to him who confessed his sins. He provided for the care of his mother. And finally, in his death on that cross, he gave us eternal life. All those who profess his name and believe in their hearts will be saved. Powerful, powerful message coming from the cross. If you have not already received Jesus Christ into your heart and into your life, I encourage you to do so. There is no better time than now because there are no guarantees in this life. We never know when our end will come. So don't wait. Do it now. This concludes our worship service today. I'm glad that you joined us, those who are here in person, as well as those who have joined us on Facebook. We're glad you're here. Now, there's one thing we all need to do, and someday maybe I'll get a chance to repeat a sermon that I did some years ago I don't know if you know who Tony Campolo is, but Tony Campolo preached a sermon one time and he told about it and I, I took a lot of that sermon giving him credit for it. But it was done in a Southern Baptist church, I believe. And the phrase that was being hammered over and over and over again on Good Friday by one of the pastors there was, it's Friday, and Sunday's coming. I think we need to remember that as we near the end of Holy Week. We need to hold on to that hope because we have that hope. You and I have the advantage that the disciples didn't have. They didn't know what was still ahead, but we do. Because on Sunday, we're going to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ as he arose from the dead. So always remember, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. You guys say it. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Hold on to that. And go in peace. Amen.